So yesterday we looked at Isaiah 6, and we'll get into Isaiah 7 and see how far we get today. <clears throat> but, um, so Isaiah 6, remember, is the goal, God's glory filling the earth, his holiness, and then people uh, dwelling uh, with God in his holiness, filling the earth like a temple uh, through salvation, through God forgiving sin. And then uh, Isaiah is called, remember in Isaiah 6, by God, he says, go tell these people you're going to preach to them, but they're not going to listen to you. And the more that you preach, the harder their hearts are going to get. They're going to be insensitive. They're not going to hear. They're not going to see. It's going to be like they're blind and deaf. Um, but God is going to judge them for their for not listening. And Isaiah six eleven, Isaiah asks, "How long am I supposed to do this?" Um, and God says, "Basically, until the cities are destroyed and everything's uh, brought down, and there and the exile takes place." But God tells them that even in the midst of this, that God's going to save a remnant. In six thirteen, He says, "Yet there will be a tenth portion." Basically, like He's going to save ten percent. Uh, of the people that he's going to protect. He says, and there will be a burning, um, like the cutting down of an oak. And then he said, whose stump remains in the field. So you cut down the oak, you have the stump left, okay, is, is what he says is basically going to be like the judgment God's going to bring. He's going to cut off most of the tree, but he's going to leave the stump. And he says, the, the holy seed is the stump, basically. And out of that, it talks about um, the Messiah is going to grow as a small shoot or branch. Okay, I don't know. If, have you guys ever cut down a tree before in your yard um, and then seen shoots or branches grow out of it afterward? Okay. Um, if you cut down a tree and it still has water and still has the ability to grow, even if, while the stump is there, shoots can come out of that stump and continue to grow uh, the tree. So that's basically what God says is going to happen, that there's going to be judgment, but he's going to preserve his people and then bring about um, uh, the this, this stuff. Now, God con uh, confronts Ahaz, the king, during this time um, through Isaiah because uh, Ahaz is going to uh, do something that makes some sense, but is disobedient to God, okay? Ahaz is, uh, there's a threat to the north. Ahaz is in the south, and that threat is um, Aram, or the, what we would call today Syria, okay? And they are threatening uh, Israel, okay? And so Ahaz is understandably afraid of this, okay? And so, but his plan is to create uh, an alliance. And he wants to ally with a nation that is an enemy. But his idea here is, um, you guys probably know this, Phrase right, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, exactly. Okay, so can you guys guess who he wants to team up with? What nation is God again? Not Babylon, that is a good guess, but Babylon's still kind of newer and growing at this time, but Isaiah will talk about them in Isaiah 13. But before that, who's the other nation that God uses to judge Israel? Who's the other nation God uses to judge Israel? In 722, it destroys the northern kingdom. No? Assyria? Assyria, yep. Yeah. Okay, Assyria. So he wants to team up with Assyria, and a lot of people are going to think this is a good, um, a good idea. And politically, it does make some sense, right? So let's team up with the 
Assyrians to fight Aram, and they, you know, they won't be a threat to us, and we can basically benefit uh, from this, this alliance. But this is not pleasing to God. And Isaiah is going to come about, and other people are going to come about and say, don't do this, you need to trust God instead, and he will... He can take care of the Arameans, he can take care of the Assyrians, but you need to trust him. And people are going to say, that's a conspiracy. You're, you're trying to get us um, killed, you're trying to get us in trouble, you're trying to do something that um, gets us not to go with this smart plan. And God is going to say in chapter 7 and chapter 8, you need to trust me and you need to fear me more than you're fearing these nations and listen to what I'm saying, not try to team up with my enemies in order to uh, basically accomplish uh, what you think is, is the right goal. Okay? So Isaiah is sent to confront um, Ahaz, and Isaiah gives him what should be good news, and basically said that, look, um, that Aram, this northern kingdom, Syria, that what they're doing is not going to stand. Okay, God is going to basically shatter this nation. It's they're going to have a temporary, um, they're going to have a temporary victory, but it's not going to last. And then he tells um, Ahaz something in Isaiah seven nine. He says, um, "Is it here? How does he phrase it? Seven nine. He says, if you will not believe, you will not last.' Okay, so he tells him he needs to trust the Lord, not." his political alliance. So he says, if you will not uh, believe, you will not last. Okay, so he tells him you need to trust the Lord. Now, God is going to offer to give Ahaz um, a sign, a miraculous sign that, I, that he says, okay, Ask me for a sign, Isaiah says on behalf of God, and I will give you a sign to show you that what I said about not fearing the Arameans, the Syrians, uh, is true and that you can trust God. Okay, So um, can, can somebody read uh, Isaiah uh, 7, 10 through 11? Uh, yes, yeah, Sophia. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask it, I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Oh, sorry, I went to fly. That's okay. Um, okay, so he tells him, Hey, look, God is telling you now to ask for a sign. So it's, it would be one thing if he said, Hey, um, I'm not going to believe God unless I see him. Um, make the moon go turn red or something like that. That wouldn't be okay. But God is saying to him through Isaiah, ask for a sign, make it as deep as you want, make it as high as you want. God will do it and he'll show you that he's going to um, basically follow through on his promise to protect you if you trust him and obey him. Okay, Don't team up with God's enemies in order to accomplish God's plan. Okay, Now, um, Ahaz is going to quote uh, the Bible okay, uh, in a disobedient way. He's going to take a verse out of context and use it inappropriately. Okay? Um, so people can do this, uh, and we'll talk about what he says in a second. But people can take um, a verse and use it to basically justify their their disobedience. So we have to be very careful that we are submitting to the word, not using the word to um, justify our own actions or desires, okay? Uh, because God is, is not happy with that. Okay, so Ahaz uh, is going to quote uh, Deuteronomy 6, 16, okay? And have you ever talked to someone who asked for, like, advice or needed help, but... Um, 
no matter what you told them, it was they weren't going to do it because they had already decided what they wanted to do. If you guys ever experienced this, where someone asks and you're like, well, then why did you ask my opinion? But what they were really asking for was for you to agree with them, for you to co-sign their opinion, or for you, you, them to be able to say, oh, well, this person also thought my idea was a good idea. So you tell them, okay, well, maybe you should do this. No, I can't do that. Well, maybe you should do this. No, I can't do that. And you're like, okay, well, then you know they're asking just to basically get um, affirmation. Um, and so Ahaz, he says here, uh, can somebody read 7.12? What does he say to kind of look good but is, is disobedient uh, to God? Isaiah 7.12, who wants to read that? Uh, yeah, you like? But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Okay, that's what he says. He says, uh, Isaiah tells him, God will give you a sign to show you if you trust him, he'll protect you. And then Ahaz says, oh, no, no, I will not test the Lord. Okay, this is in 7, uh, 12. Okay, now uh, he's quoting, right, uh, Deuteronomy 6.16 that talks about don't test God as they did in the wilderness. Don't say, God, I'll only obey you, believe you, trust in you, if you do what I say first. If you, if you follow what I say, then I'll know you're worthy of my trust. That's, that's what Deuteronomy 6.16 is saying. Jesus quotes this in the wilderness when Satan says, well, jump off this and, and God will save you, right? And, and Jesus says, I'm not supposed to put God to the test. I'm not supposed to put him in a position where he has to fulfill what I say in order to be uh, true and right. Okay, so, but Ahaz, he quotes this in a disobedient way to say, oh, no, I don't want to test God. I'll just do my own plan. Okay, so uh, now I, Isaiah says, okay, your plan is going to lead us to exile. Your plan is going to lead us to um the collapse of the kingdom. Okay, so Ahaz's plan versus God's plan is going to lead to exile and collapse. And so that's going to be a problem. So Isaiah says, even though you didn't ask for a sign, I am going, uh, God is going to give you a sign that this exile is going to happen um, pretty soon. And he says, by the way, Isaiah is going to have some kids. And he says, before my kids grow up, this nation that you're afraid of is going to be defeated. So you didn't need to team up with Assyria. But he says, now, because of your actions, we're going to go into exile. And there's going to be another child born that's going to be born into uh, this exile because of your the consequences of your your choices your actions. Okay, can somebody read um, Isaiah seven uh, thirteen through fourteen? Isaiah seven thirteen through fourteen. Oh yeah, Sophia. And he said, "Hear the." And he said, "Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also?" Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so we have here that God's sign is uh, the virgin will conceive and then bear a son whose name is Emmanuel. This is in Isaiah 7, 14. But we also need to see um, basically what Emmanuel is going to experience. And then there's going to be some questions about, okay, is Emmanuel Isaiah's son? Or is this a virgin, really a virgin birth like the New Testament talks about? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But we need to see the context that Emmanuel is going to be born into. Um, can somebody read Isaiah 5, 7, 15, and 16? Isaiah 7, 15 and 16, the next verses, 
Basically, we need to see what Emmanuel is going to experience. Basically, what he's going to even eat uh, is going to t uh, tell us something. Yeah, what? Uh, Isaiah 7, 15 to 16? Yes, please. Uh, he will eat curds and honey. At the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. But before the Lord knows enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be abandoned. Okay, so it says he's going to eat curds and honey, okay? What, that may not be a big deal to us, but this is the uh, food of exile. This is what you're eating when you're trying to just kind of survive off the land in the wilderness after Israel's been destroyed. So Emmanuel is going to be born into what? Exile. Exile, yep. He's going to experience exile uh, because of Ahaz's sin, okay? And so that's going to be important, okay? And um, basically Isaiah is going to have a son that's going to grow up, and before this son is able to really speak very well, the nation that Ahaz is trying to get away from is going to be defeated. So he, But he's still stuck with this alliance now, okay? And so now he is stuck with uh, not only disobedience to God, but now he's moved his people closer to exile, okay? And so Emmanuel talks about the virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, okay? Um, and then this is obviously referenced in uh, Matthew uh, 1, 18 through 25, um, and Luke, no, it's a couple places, but Luke 1, 35, okay? And sometimes they're like, well, is a virgin really referring to a woman who has not had a sexual relationship or as a virgin just a young woman because they did call young women back in this time uh, virgins right so they would talk about an unmarried woman would be considered a, a virgin daughter of you know whoever and they uh, that's what the, how they were referred to but the idea is that a unmarried woman um, is in this time understood uh, with exceptions to be a uh, young woman who has not had a marital sexual relationship yet, okay? So, we need to understand um, what God is getting at here. Um, we have the births of uh, significant individuals, okay? Um, so, you guys remember Abraham and Sarah, right? Um, they're not able to what? What was their kind of problem? And even God promises them something, but they're not able to have children. Yep. What does God uh, do for their situation? Yeah, he intervenes so that they're able to have children. Okay, so that's significant. Hannah in 1 Samuel 1 and 2, she is married, but she's unable to what? She's able to have uh, have children, right? And then God intervenes and gives her who? Children, children Samuel. Yep. And then in Luke 1, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, and Zechariah, who's a priest, they're unable to what? Have children. And God intervenes and gives them who? Baby. Baby. Who is the baby? <laughs> Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist, yeah. Okay, so we see God's intervention in the birth of significant individuals. So Jesus is the most significant individual in history. God, do um, you guys see how God kind of takes it up a notch with the virgin birth? With Abraham and Sarah, with Hannah, with Zacharias and Elizabeth, God intervened and helped, but he moved the process along. In here, it's a totally virgin birth, right? There's no marital sexual relationship yet, okay? And um, so basically, now this we read in Matthew 1, this is um, Joseph's perspective, and it actually, Matthew 1 gives us some, some uh, historical evidence of the truth of the story. Because sometimes people think like, well, Joseph is dumb. Doesn't he know how things work? If a girl is pregnant, she must have had a sexual relationship. 
that's what he's understanding, and then he's told by the angel, no, something else is going on. Um, Joseph is stuck in this position. He's stuck between two options that neither of which are good, okay? If Mary is pregnant and Joseph is betrothed or engaged to her, he cannot marry her because it threatens the uh, seed line of his entire family of the Davidic seed. If, if Mary has become pregnant by another man, Joseph cannot marry her because this totally uh, undoes the family line of passing on the, the seed and the tribes and all these different things. Okay? And, and Joseph is of the family of David, right? So this is important. But he also doesn't want to bring the full consequences of the law against Mary. So he plans to divorce her quietly and without disgrace. He, uh, this engagement process was the first stage of marriage before they were actually living together and uh, required a divorce to bring to an end. Then the angel comes to him and explains to him that he doesn't need to be afraid to take Mary as his wife because there's a bigger thing going on here that God is doing. Mary has not committed fornication and gotten pregnant, that God is working out Isaiah 7, right? Um, and so can somebody read uh, Matthew 1, uh, 22 through 23? Uh, yeah, you like <coughs> 21. Uh, sure, you can start at 21. Uh, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people uh, from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall, shall be with a child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated... It just means God with us. Okay. So thank you. So he talks about there that his name is going to be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Yahweh's salvation, that's what Isaiah means. So, so Matthew is tying together a bunch of texts that have to do with Jesus saving, and the core of that will be saving from sin. Okay. We get now um, Matthew one twenty three gives us that this, this virgin birth is the sign that Isaiah was talking about, that Emmanuel will be born into the exile with his people um, in Matthew uh, 1.23. Okay? And then Matthew, even though Matthew is a Jewish gospel, it aims at showing the Jews that Jesus is the true Messiah, Jesus is the true King, it also has an evangelistic purpose to the Gentiles. It's probably written in Greek. Uh, as well. And Matthew makes sure to translate for his Greek readers what Emmanuel means, because the Jews would understand this, but what does Emmanuel the name mean? God yeah, God with us. Yeah. So he says that the name means, from Isaiah uh, 7, 14, uh, God uh, with us. Okay. So this is another indication that the Messiah will be God and man. He will be God in the person of Messiah. Okay? And then, by the way, just something kind of interesting for how the structure of the book of Matthew works. Do you guys remember at the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus is giving his great commission. He talks about all authority has been given to me. Uh, go, therefore, make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And what's the promise Jesus gives in Matthew 28, 20? And lo, I am... What? I am always with you. Right? So you have God with us at the beginning of Matthew, and then Matthew 28... Uh, 20, Jesus says, I am with you always. So you have God with us at the beginning, God with us at the end in the person of Jesus. Okay, so 
Um, this is what is being fulfilled here in the in the birth of uh, in the birth of Jesus. Okay, so Isaiah gives a near-term prophecy about his own children, which are described in Isaiah uh, eight, where she says that basically his his sons are going to be named things to show that the exile is coming that Syria is going to uh, be destroyed, that they weren't the threat that people thought they were, but that now Emmanuel is going to be born into exile, but he will be born into uh, exile to end the exile. Okay, so that's going to be a key point to understand, that Messiah... Uh, Emmanuel will be born into the exile in order to bring the exile to an end. He will do this through Isaiah salvation. Okay, so um, we get now an idea of, okay, Isaiah 6 talks about, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And then uh, we're now seeing, okay, well, how is this going to be worked out? Well, it's going to be worked out through this one who, is, uh, who comes into the world, born of a virgin, who is uh, God with us. Okay. So there's judgment that's going to take place, but there's hope that the Messiah will be born into this judgment. Um, and kind of the cool thing from this that we, we see through uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 8 is that, um, well, let me fast forward a little bit. Hebrews chapter 2, one of the things that uh, the author of Hebrews is dealing with is Jews would say, uh, who weren't who didn't believe in Jesus, they're like, Jesus isn't that great. He's a man. He suffered. He died. That, that can't be, um, he can't be worthy of our, our loyalty and trust if those things are the case. And the author of Hebrews uh, quotes Isaiah 8 and says, no, Jesus was Emmanuel. He was born into the context of exile to break the exile, but Jesus had to become man. He had to, he had to suffer, and he suffered, uh, took on humanity and suffered with us so that he could what? Why does Jesus come into the world ultimately? For his glory. Ultimately. Oh, okay, yes, for his glory. But, yeah, to save God's people from their sins, right? To die, right? So he's going to, um, the, the Messiah is going to be uh, one of us, right? Um, but you have this idea in, in chapter 8, which is quoted in Hebrews 2, that Emmanuel uh, suffers uh, with us. He's part of our group uh, so that he can suffer what? So he suffers. Jesus didn't just come to suffer with us. He came to suffer what? For us. For us, yeah. Suffer uh, for us. Okay? And then we see here Isaiah uh, 53. Right? So the author of Hebrews says, yes, Jesus is the divine son of God. Hebrews chapter 1. It has this unique role that no one else has. And you may think that him becoming man was... A step down, or that he, you know, was, uh, or the fact that he suffered, or the fact that he died. But he says, no, you don't understand. This was Jesus accomplishing something that made him unique, that made him central in God's plan. That he suffered and became man, so that he could experience these things, suffer with us, so that he could suffer for us and die for our sins. So the author of Hebrews is is saying, you cannot avoid Jesus is what he's getting at with, uh, with Jews who are tempted to kind of back away from, um, from Jesus and go back to Judaism. He says there's, there's nowhere to go back to now that Jesus has, uh, has accomplished this work. Okay, so, um, so that's what uh, Isaiah 8 will get, get at here. But Isaiah uh, chapter 8 will continue on here after the uh, Emmanuel prophecy. Isaiah chapter... Well, actually, let me um, pause here. We're gonna uh, before we get into Isaiah eight. I want to kind of indicate something else. 
that will be helpful for you guys to kind of understand as far as just biblical prophecy goes because we're getting into and will continue to get into a lot of prophetic books. It's important for us to understand what sometimes is called uh, the prophetic um, mountaintops. Okay, and I'll, I'll use a, an example of this. Okay, so I'm going to draw a guy standing down here. Maybe a little hard to see, but I'll, you guys will get it. Um, and he's looking at a, ser a range of hills and mountains. Okay, and his sight line goes up through here like this. Okay, now I want to kind of make a point about um, biblical prophecy. Um, because sometimes we get a little confused because it doesn't always, it's not always presented in order or sometimes it's glimpses of different things for a different purpose. So that's like the book of like, even like Revelation. Revelation 4 and 5, I would argue, is the ultimate goal that happens at the end, but it's put closer to the beginning, right? So it's here's the goal, here's what else is going to happen to bring, bring that goal about. Same thing with Isaiah 6. Okay, but here's, here's the deal, what, why this is called the prophetic mountaintop. Have you guys ever, you guys know Mr. Laportio's room and like the wash and stuff, if you look out that way? You guys know what I'm talking about? It's not actually that way, it's that way. But um, if you stand there, I was like sitting in, I use his room for study hall in sixth period, and I would open the door sometimes when the weather's good, and I look up, and I was seeing like, kind of the rolling hills and like the like the high point of like this mountain that had this little tower on top of it that had this flashing red light. And I'm like, it'd be interesting. I wouldn't actually want to do this, but it would be interesting to try to walk a straight line up through that. But the problem is my sight line from sitting in Mr. Laportio's class and looking up that is I'm missing a lot of stuff, right? I'm missing the fact that I'd have to cross roads in the freeway. I'm missing the fact that I'd have to go through people's yards that I'm not seeing. I'm missing what's on the other side of these hills that I'm seeing this part of the hill, but not seeing over here. Does that make sense? So a lot of times as the prophets are looking, God's giving them these things, but they're not seeing every bit of what is going to happen or how it's all going to happen, or what order it's going to happen in. And so we have to realize that, that as we read, we go, okay, it must be this, then this, then this. Not necessarily true. So we just have to be aware that sometimes it will be talking about, like, Messiah's death, and then sometimes it'll be talking about his victory. And it's like, well, there's time in between those things. And that's true. Like in uh, Zechariah 9, it talks about Messiah riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. Um, and then it talks about him uh, reigning over the nations. Well, we understand that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, he was rejected, died for sins, resurrected. But his, his kingdom, his ruling over the nations hasn't been fully expressed yet, right? So... What we're not seeing in that prophecy is we're missing the kind of element of time, okay? And so let me give you like another example. Let's say like you're at a museum or something and you go into this hallway and you're there as an American and you have a friend there who's from another country. And on the wall, you look at two portraits. One is a portrait of George Washington and the other is a portrait of Joe Biden, okay? Now, you as an American understand a little bit more of kind of what's going on there, but what might your non-American friend think if they just see George Washington, Joe Biden? What might they think about um, the American presidency? Okay, come on guys, I think of that. They might, okay, so you understand that George Washington is the first president. What number president is Joe Biden? 46, 46. But your non-American friend might think what? 
not the opposite. They might think that this is president number one and what? Two. 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 Or they might think there's only been two American presidents, which you may see, oh, this is maybe referring to like the beginning to now, right? But, and you understand there's multiple presidents and years in between those things. But your non-American friend might think, well, wait a second. Okay, so there's only two presidents. George Washington was the first one and Joe Biden was the second one. That's the kind of confusion that can happen as you read a book like Isaiah, Revelation, Zechariah, is you think this happens, then immediately this. So, for example, Micah 5.2 talks about the Messiah coming from Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 uh, and 5.4 talks about him ruling as king over the nations. Right? So it's like, okay, did that happen at the same time? No, there's, there's time in between. Micah is taking themes and episodes and putting them together uh, for a certain reason. So that's important to understand as we go through these, um, these prophecies, is they don't always happen this, then this, then this. God says, here are some important things you need to know in order to have hope and to live in the present. Okay. It's not really about building out a chart um, of things to, to know when and how exactly everything's going to happen. Okay, So that's important to realize. So when there's a prophecy like Isaiah's talking about his sons, and then he's talking about Emmanuel being born, people might think, well, how come Emmanuel wasn't born during Isaiah's time? Because he's talking about near prophecy, and he's talking about far prophecy, but he's relating them. Uh, together for those reasons. So that's important to understand um, and it just takes careful reading and study to understand that uh, kind of prophetic, uh, prophetic mountaintop um, of what's going on, that there's a lot that the prophets aren't saying or aren't revealing because they're not, um, they're not showing every step necessarily of God's plan in order. Okay, So it's kind of like um, Kind of like, you know how movies have like flash forwards, flash backs, and then it's part of the story again? It, the prophets do that too. Um, the gospels do that sometimes, right? Where they will present Jesus' um, episodes of his life in different order to show something, to demonstrate something. Okay? Um, and then the point of prophecy, by the way, is people live out of what they expect from the future. Okay, so if you expect the future to be a certain way, it impacts how you live now, right? So the fact that Jesus is going to come back and what is described in places like Isaiah 6 or like Isaiah 9, that Jesus is going to rule over the nations, right? That um, impacts how we live uh, today or it should impact how we live today. Um, and everyone has, lives out of their view of the future. Um, Environmentalists, you guys know environmentalists, people who think there's like a climate emergency, that the world is coming to an end, um, and that they've been predicting this since like at least the 1970s, that the world is, is going to uh, be unsustainable and come to an end. Um, but they live out of that. They live out of that um, concern, out of that fear, and they do certain things um, in order to try to live in light of what they think the future will be. Well, everyone does that. So that's what the, the prophets tell us. God says, here's the goal for the future, and we want to ask when, where, how, and God says, that's not the point. The goal is, this is the reality. Now you need to live like this because this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so that's what, um, that's what the point is, not like, is Jesus going to come back tomorrow? The point is, Jesus is going to come and reign I need to live like that right now is, is how we should, uh, should think about that. Um, and then every couple of years, people write a book trying to predict when Jesus will return. And it's always, uh, it's always wrong. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, we've got to end that there for today. But let's go ahead and get... Uh,